I'm starting of all things with the first slide of a Nobel Prize lecture by Martin Chalfie. And I'm gonna talk about his work a little bit later, but I thought maybe we could get started by thinking about these profound observations or the mixture. So there's the famous statement by uh, Yogi Berra. It's probably true about everything. So I'm not sure why it relates specifically for Chalfie's work, but it's, it's an important point. The more interesting one for today's talk, though, is this one that comes from Jules Verne. Now, Jules Verne was a sort of early 20th century, late 19th century writer of science fiction stories. And the one, the book that is rather famous is this one called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea which features an enormous battle between a submarine and a, um, and, an, and a giant squid. It's been made into a movie, of course, and several movies, in fact. In addition, he wrote a book called Around the World in 80 Days, which was turned into another kind of movie success. At any rate, this comment that comes here. The Nautilus, by the way, is his submarine. Okay. And he says that the, the Nautilus floated in the midst of truly living light, an infinite agglomeration of colored globules of diaphanous jelly. And this isn't fantasy. This is real. If anybody has spent any time in the tropics or swum in the seas at the, in, in the tropics, you know that at night, as soon as you stick your hands in the water, it glows all around you. And this is because of a lot of fluorescent organisms that are living in the water. The last is kind of a joke, except might as well think about it. This is the comment from Douglas Adams' famous book. I hope you've had a chance to read it. It's just completely absurd called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it is worth following up. It was at one point a wonderful radio show. At any rate, his writing style is, as you can see, a little excessive. But it basically is saying that it's such a bizarrely improbable coincidence that anything so mind-bogglingly useful could have evolved purely by chance that some think thinkers have chosen to see as a final clinching proof of the non-existence of God. Now you try and figure the meaning of that out. That the idea is that something like that could have emerged. And I'll leave it to you to sort of play around with that as a set of thoughts. What I want to talk about today though, is fluorescence and fluorescence in biology. As you know, we've covered this a little bit. We covered this more than a little bit yes, last lecture in terms of some of the equipment that was used in the development of fluorescence microscopes, of ultraviolet microscopes. And the idea that one could see interesting information in biological materials, it turns out it wasn't that popular for quite a while, but people were aware of it. For instance, I cited last time the paper by Polycard and Payot in which they looked at silkworms by ultraviolet microscopy uh, to look at the fluorescence. This was in 1925. At the same time, people were aware that chlorophyll would fluoresce. And it turns out that this is one of these peculiar things in a way. Fireflies were well known. And as I mentioned before, also that jellyfish were fluorescent. The firefly fluorescence was caused by a pair of molecules called luciferin and luciferase. And you may have heard of this in that context. 
But in fact, the idea of a luciferin luciferase complex compound goes back quite a ways and turns out to be involved again in some of the uh, jellyfish fluorescence. So it's, it's kind of an interesting point. So it was found Although, as you'll see in a minute, jellyfish are rather difficult to work with. But I do remember when I was a child, and I was once, one of the companies, it was uh, Sigma Biochemicals, some of you that have been in labs maybe still are aware of that company, used to pay kids to collect fireflies, to extract the tails from the fireflies, to do biochemical work using the firefly luciferin luciferase complex. We'll get to some of that in a minute. So there was some basic understanding about biological fluorescence, starting, you know, in the uh, pretty much early parts of the 20th century. But then Kuhn's, for instance, developed this way of taking specific biological materials that were not fluorescent and making them fluorescent. So he coupled, say, fluorescein and other molecules to antibody molecules so that he could then track where the antibodies were in sections. So you would set up an experiment where you would have tissue. If you have a piece of tissue here with some target material that you care about, which is not necessarily fluorescent, right, but it's still there somewhere. If you have antibodies that bind to it, well, then the antibodies would be a specific reagent to locate this material. But you still couldn't see the antibodies unless the antibodies had been made fluorescent themselves. And so this was the sort of thing that Coombs, Coombs pioneered in the idea that you could make antibodies fluorescent and then see these antibodies later on. At then a number of companies started developing fluorescent reagents other than fluorescein that were different colors. So you could label something with a red label and something else with a, a green label. Those were the sorts of things that you saw in the pictures that I showed at the end of the last lecture. And the other thing that people developed was the idea of taking some of these fluorophores, like fluorescein, like others, and binding them not to antibodies, but to a specific kind of a protein. In this case, I'll use the example of phalloidin. Phalloidin is a mushroom protein, comes from a phalloides mushroom. And it turns out that it binds actively to filamentous forms of actin. And so people have coupled phalloidin directly to fluorophores and created a fluorescent label that specifically labels actin filaments. So that's the kind of stuff we had been talking about before. And then something kind of exploded in the field major change occurred, starting actually in 1962, by these initially done by Osamu Shimamura, who was the first to be involved in this. He published his work, uh, okay, he published his work in 1962, uh, initially. And then Chalfi and Sien both worked on this material that he identified much later in the 1990s and a little bit in the 1980s. So there was a, quite a gap between his observations and the ability of these other people to take over and carry out molecular analysis and biochemical analysis. And I want to go through all of that at least briefly. So let's start 
with the material that Chimamora was looking at. This is it, gorgeous. It's a jellyfish. It's a jellyfish called Aquora. And it was found in the, um, primarily in the waters on the Pacific Northwest. The place that there was a great deal of work done with it was a lab in Washington state called Friday Harbor. And Shimamura went there several summers, which is about the only time you can work in that lab in that weather, and collected these, these jellyfish. So it turns out that the jellyfish fluoresce. Here's a picture from the top down of that jellyfish. It's about four or five inches in diameter. I think, and you can see in the picture beneath that only at the edges is it fluorescent. And what's going on at the edges is that there are little, little vesicles, which are the fluorophore containing vesicles that are found there. And uh, it's interesting to read Shimamura's original paper on this because he describes doing the extract on 6,000 jellyfish, or some huge number of extracted jellyfish. And in the original work, and I'm going to talk basically today from some of those lectures that were given when those three men received the Nobel Prize because they summarized their work quite well. The problem that Shimomura had when he started his work was that jellyfish are mostly slime, as you probably realize. And in order to get any material out that he could work with, he needed to somehow cut out to extract this material from the edges. And so what he did to begin with, and he describes this in his Nobel lecture, he actually, he himself, his wife, kids, he found kids on the street, brought them in to help them out, would take a pair of scissors and cut along the edges of this thing and collect just the rings that you get into a bucket of seawater. He then came back the next summer to try to get more work done on this material. And one of his colleagues developed this extraordinary looking machine where what you would do is place his, the side view of the jellyfish. Okay, you would place this thing roughly in this position over here and slowly rotate the jellyfish so that this blade, which was a meat cutting blade, sort of thing you now see in, uh, in supermarkets and delis where they're slicing one meter or another, that this would sort of slice off the edges as you rotated the jellyfish. This improved things enormously. Okay. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavor of, of what he was like. So I've got a bunch of excerpts from his Nobel Prize speech, and I'm afraid you're gonna to have to put up with me trying to read them to you. But basically, he starts when he was 16 years old and the uh, Second World War was ending, and he was living not far from Nagasaki, which was a place, the second place that uh, uh, atomic bomb was dropped. And so he was exposed to it. He saw the explosion. And fortunately, as he says, he was lucky to survive. But afterwards, because everything had been destroyed in Japan, he found it very difficult to get any kind of schooling. And so, as he says, he, he idled for just two years. He was sort of doing nothing. And then he learned that the pharmacy school was slowly going to open a temporary campus near his house. 
and he applied and was accepted. And, and so that's where his education began. I'm going to now do a big jump from 1945 for 20 years to 1962, when by then he had learned about his interest in fluorescent materials, fluorescent cells. And one of the things that he had found was this puzzle that he was looking at this luminescence, this bioluminescence in a jellyfish under the assumption that it was a luciferin luciferase type of interaction. And he said, though, that he couldn't get anywhere. He kept looking for the small molecule and an enzyme and couldn't find the pair for this organism. And so he had this idea, and you'll notice it, it happened on, on a rowboat, right? He's sailing in a boat or rowing in a boat in the bay of uh, outside of Friday Harbor, letting his mind idle. And we're going to, it's an interesting philosophy about how ideas come to people. Some of them come about when you let your mind sort of wander. And this is a wonderful example of that. And his reaction was to say, well, maybe I'm, I'm doing this wrong. So maybe if it's a protein, it would be pH sensitive. So we went back and, and tried a whole bunch of different pHs. And he saw some, some activity at neutral pHs, but not at pH four. And so he took out this material and did get it to fluoresce a little bit when it was neutralized with, with sodium bicarbonate. So it worked. But the next thing that happened was he threw this, this reaction mixture, he was throwing it out. He tossed it into the sink and suddenly it blew, it, it lit up with a huge bright flash. And he finally realized that what was going on was that his aquarium, which was right next to the sink, had a kind of an overflow, it was a seawater aquarium they were at a marine lab, this Friday Harbor lab. And they were working with seawater. So there was seawater in the sink. And he figured finally that it was the seawater that made this thing fluoresce, just glow like crazy. And with that as a background, he isolated then what the component of seawater was that was important. It turned out to be calcium ions. And so calcium ions activated the fluorescence of this particular molecule, which he then named a quorum. It's called a quorum because the jellyfish from which it was taken is named a quora. Okay. And it was used. Immediately, you could, you could inject this molecule into a neuron. You could sort of swamp a neuron with this thing. And then if there was calcium nearby or calcium active, it would fluoresce. And so you could use it as a marker for where calcium was being released in the cell. And he also found a contaminating protein. There is a small amount of a protein that in some ways seemed to just be in the way of doing this isolation of a quorum. But he did discover that if you irradiated it with blue light or somewhat UV light, it fluoresced green. And so this thing he called green fluorescent protein. It took him another almost 10 to 15 years to actually isolate this protein, the green fluorescent protein, because it was such a minor component. And so the field, although it started in 1960s, really didn't develop until the 1970s. But now this is what we know about the structure of, of GFP and its related molecules. 
And there is an enormous family of these things now that are all called various fluorescent proteins, green, yellow, red fluorescent protein. And what it is, is that they have some sort of complicated, I'll draw it on the side here. They have a general protein structure. Then they have this sort of core, which I'll just keep like this. And then they have a little bit more protein out here. The stuff on the edges, uh, these linear sections that I've drawn, are not relevant to fluorescence. The only thing that's relevant to the fluorescence is this core structure, which turns out to be a complicated beta barrel, right? You've all seen beta barrels. It's all constructed of beta sheets tightly wound around each other, okay? And the interesting component of that is that within the beta barrel, there's a small set of amino acids that are actually hydrophilic. Normally these things are not hydrophilic within this beta barrel, but these are hydrophilic amino acids that interact. And it turns out that's where the fluorescence originates as these molecules shift around and adjust their, basically their atomic structure, their electron structure, they can release light energy. The interesting thing about this is it requires basically no input. Well, no, I take it back. It requires a light source. So it, it has to be activated by a, a shorter wavelength signal. But basically you don't need any secondary components to it at all. <clears throat> so this is where Chalfi uh, comes in and his essays about his experience go on and on and on. I'll post them and you're welcome to read them. But what became critical in his life as a scientist was working with Sidney Brenner. Now, Sidney Brenner was one of the early members of the bacteriophage group that founded, more or less founded molecular biology. He was one of the people, he and Benzer were the people who actually set up the genetic basis for understanding molecular biology in bacteria initially and in bacteriophage. Brenner had decided that bacteria and bacteriophage were not a very good model to work with because the bacterial or the, bacter the bacterial metabolism really might have very little to do with sort of more elaborate multicellular organisms. And so he chose to start a whole field based on this nematode worm called C. elegans. You'll see references to C. elegans all the way, all over now. Um, but he established genetic lines of this thing. He established that one could predict knowing the individual cells within the embryonic form, you could predict what organs they would become. And so this became, in his mind, an extremely powerful tool for this. Well, Chalfi became interested in this material, and he gives some examples in the Nobel Prize talk of studies that people had done on C. elegans beforehand. One of the useful things about it, as he points out, is that it is transparent. And so if you have a transparent organism, you can look through it and see the cells much more clearly if you have appropriate markers for them. And so one of the things that Chalfi then was able to do was to take the genetic material that by then was understood. I'll show you another example of this as well, where it was possible to clone the gene for GFP. And by cloning the gene for GFP, he was able to introduce it into specific cells of, an organ, of the organism. 
And so he eventually published this paper with the cover in science in which he showed that in the C. elegans, you could actually get a very limited expression like this of specific neurons that were fluorescent. And he then sort of extended this material, he and lots of others extended this material to realize that if you could transfect this gene for GFP into say an embryo or into, if not even an embryo, into an egg and have that gene replicate throughout the organism, you could create, and this is a set of images that's kind of mind blowing, you could create a whole set of organisms that were completely fluorescent. It's kind of amazing. I like the, the green fluorescent rabbit, for instance, as an example over here. And this collection of fish, which are all glowing green, as well as mice. And here's the C. elegans over here. Uh, okay, and a fly. So any organism into which you could transfect this gene would become fluorescent. And not only that, um, here's an example of some cells in culture that were made fluorescent with GFP. So it becomes a very powerful tool all by itself as a genetic element. If you can transfect it into cells, you can pick the cells that it goes into, you can, by knowing the cells that serve as the origins for this, you could then direct what kinds of fluorescence you could generate. There are some wonderful images that came out at the time in which they'd been able to get the gene expressed just in the rhodopsin, in the photoreceptors of the eye. And there are these pictures of these animals with glowing eyes looking at you. He doesn't show them in this particular array. One of, one of the things though that came out that I thought was particularly amusing, these GFP containing fish, people were immediately taken up in a certain way by uh, fish fanciers, the idea that supposing you could create a fish tank that you would have in your office or in your living room and just turn on the UV light and see the fish glowing. So it became an idea that a lot of pet stores started thinking about the pet stores. It was rapidly shut down as an idea because in order to do this, you had to do a genetic manipulation of the fish. And there was a great deal of concern that some of these glowing fish would then be flushed down the toilet, enter into the uh, general environment and breed in who knows what interesting ways in the ocean. So the idea of being able to buy a fluorescent fish was was really killed and, and it's no longer available. So you missed out. Well, let me just sort of summarize what he was saying then about the value, the value of GFP as a marker. Again, this comes from Chalfie's Nobel Prize speech. <clears throat> and what he says is that GFP has these advantages and that it can become a heritable component becomes part of the, the genome, that it itself doesn't seem to affect any, any biological processes by itself, okay? That it's relatively non-invasive, that it's small, and then you can actually see it in living tissues because it itself isn't toxic. If you illuminate the cells, living cells, with the right wavelengths of light, you will be able to see the fluorescence from GFP. So this was more than just a simple um, curiosity. 
but still not, not that profoundly useful until the work came along of Roger Tsen. And what he, he describes, I, I love the way these little bits of, of material that are sort of revealed in the Nobel Prize speeches. And that's what I'm using as a source here. Sen writes, he remembered when he was trying to think about how this, how to work with the genetics of, of fluorescent material, he remembered that certain jellyfish contained a green fluorescent protein because it was a contaminant that had to be separated from a quarry. You may remember that point from earlier today. Okay, so he says one day, just sort of on a lark, he typed in green fluorescent protein into Medline. Medline was the equivalent now of Google just for, just for scientists, okay? In fact, it was originally set up for literature searches within the relatively narrow field of cancer and not very much in basic biology. But at any rate, they had set this thing up and suddenly he found this paper by Pressure who reported that he'd actually cloned the gene for GFP, okay? That he had isolated it and figured out that the chromophore was really part of the protein itself. Okay? And so he eventually learned that Pressure was no longer interested in following this stuff. And so what Sien did was to clone, following the cloning material. I'm not going to go through the details of what he showed, but he basically went through and analyzed the structure of the molecule and showed where the fluorophore component came from, the material I showed earlier on in the talk. And began to look into ways in which you could do two things. One was you could take part of this chromophore or the chromophore part of the gene or the entire gene and fuse it to any protein that you cared about within the cell so that you could end up creating something that looked, um, if I can sort of simplify it here, if you have a little ball that's GFP, as a protein component of another protein, and this could be any protein you cared about, okay? As long as you had the sequence for both of them, you could create a DNA sequence that would basically be, here's the protein you care about, going from here to here, and here's the GFP sequence. So that what you would end up with is a protein in which you had integrated GFP. And so wherever that protein was synthesized by a cell, you would see it as a fluorescent protein. Really kind of a remarkable observation. The other thing that he did was he manipulated the fluorophore structure. He was a, a chemist who was able to work through, remember we have this complicated barrel structure like this, but within it, this small set of amino acids that served as the chromophore. And what he showed was that you can make small changes in this, and change the color spectrum of the individual protein. So let's see if I can give you some examples of that, okay? He was able to generate from, for instance, from the original molecule of GFP from here, he was able to generate a family of proteins which had other names, okay? Eventually, the name started to go crazy in which the colors were given, it's, it's almost like wallpaper colors, right? We have plum, we have grape, 
we have raspberry, we have another grape, we have cherry, strawberry, tangerine, tomato, orange, banana, okay? Honeydew. Each one of these, as you see here, can be excited by one wavelength and then emit at the other. So it's excited at 540 and then emits 553, which remember is a little bit longer in wavelength. And so he created this entire palette of various reagents. They have some other characteristics as well. And so different ones are being used as uh, labels in different environments. But what's very clear, you see from this kind of list, is that you could create an image with multiple fluorescent signals within it, each one of which comes from a different protein. And these are internal proteins. These are endogenous proteins rather than applied proteins. So you could actually look at metabolic processes that are going on. Okay. And the last thing that I'd point out is that not only are these proteins, these, these fluorescent proteins found in, in jellyfish, they're actually found in quite a few different corals as well. And so for that, I can leave you with a kind of a story about a man by the name of Guy Cox. You may have seen his name once before. It was by Guy Cox, who is in uh, Australia running a major laboratory and studying also fluorescent proteins. What's interesting with, about his work is that when graduate students or postdocs come to work in his lab, the first thing he does is give them essentially an ultraviolet light, a set of goggles and swim gear, maybe a scuba set, and says, go out and swim along the Great Barrier Reef and see if you can find any coral that light up. And if you can, bring them back here and we'll start extracting, see if we can extract a colored fluorescent protein from the coral. So this is an ongoing story. And I think I can more or less stop at this point. What's happened, just to make the point a little clearer, is that these fluorescent proteins have now become an essential part of quite a bit of modern research. You'll see them showing up a little bit more when I talk about some of the more advanced techniques of fluorescence. So I think I can stop here.